Welcome to the True Face Podcast. My name is Robbie Engel, and I'll be your guide as we have conversations about what we can learn from what's going on in our lives. As we continue this second conversation with Jamie Winship, we're going to continue to unpack where we get stuck in our relationships with God and others. And at trueface.org, we've got resources to help you. And I talk about the True Face journey, a nine-month framework to experience these types of communities that are safe enough and authentic enough to, uh, for us to wrestle with how we see God and see ourselves. So check it out at trueface.org or on the app, the True Face Life app, and enjoy as we jump in to the continuation of my conversation with Jamie Winship. But you've got to learn to hear my voice. And so that, so it wasn't like that all the time. In fact, when I, when I left the police department, you know, after my little discussion with the CIA and I went to grad school, I took a year of Bible in seminary. Hmm. I wanted to, and that hurt me more than anything I'd ever done because what Why? happened, was everything I knew down in my gut, so to speak, just my beautiful relationship with Christ was so, it was so Hebraic, we'll call it. It was so whole, all of me. And then I got into seminary and it became Hellenistic. It just became my brain. It was really fascinating. And I got, I fell in love with the intellectual side of the apologetics and polemics. And then when we moved into the Muslim world, I was ineffective. Because all I knew how to do at that point was debate Muslims on the Quran and the Bible. Yep. And, it, and, it, and it, was, it was so disheartening. It was like God didn't come with us into the Muslim world. And mm. it took five years of that frustration for God to say to me, five years of, of like, wow, we are failures in this. We are, it's not working. Um, I got arrested and put on trial, all this stuff going on. It's like, where did God go? And it wasn't that it wasn't where did God go? It's where did I go? And I went from hmm. my heart back into my head. That's, that's where I went. And it took five years before I just in desperation, I said to God, I, I stopped hearing him, but I, it, he was, he was still speaking. I just wasn't listening anymore. And I think this hmm. is very biblical pattern you see in scripture of people they stop listening like david when it says david inquired of the lord and then as opposed to when the passage starts with and david thought to himself those are the when you see those two phrases and david inquired of the lord he makes these amazing brave decisions courageous decisions and when he thought to himself he moves into immediate self-protection and self-promotion and it destroys him and his men and so at those five years, the Lord, in that darkness of that, the Lord taught me this. Stop self-protecting and self-promoting. This is not about how smart you are. It's not about how well you can out-argue a Muslim. This is about other-focused, self-emptying, unconditional love for your enemy. That's what this is about. That's what, it, And it's down which, here. Which is connected to our identity. Can, can we be other self focused and self not self promoting without identity? Unpack for us how that, and can we know our specific identity without listening and hearing from God? No, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, only the true you can be other focused, self emptying, unconditional love towards your enemy. Only only the part of you that God created can be that. The false me, the invented me, the ego me, the self protection, the shadow me can only be self-focused. That's all mm. it'll ever do is self-focus and self-protect. And as soon as a person starts talking, you can hear it. You can hear that self-protection and self-promotion. Not They don't have to be bragging and all that. It's just, it's just the number one goal of my life is my own safety. That's it. And you can hear whole communities talk like this. And Christ is saying the opposite. He's, he, you know, he didn't consider heaven something to be exploited, but he, he emptied himself. For who? For the for his enemy, you know? And so, yeah, so the true me longs to be other focused. It's so it's so beautiful. My true the true me longs to be other focused and self-emptying and loving. Um, the false me, motivated by fear, turns inward. And so here's here's just the, the main idea. It, it's the rule of it's the rule of the whole universe. All living systems can only organize around identity 
identity is the only organizing principle in the universe of all any living system. So unpack that. Level, what's that? Uh, uh, unpack that. That identity is the organizing. Okay. So so like for from a cell to a human to a orange tree, a healthy living system is organized around the truth of its identity. A good tree, Jesus calls it, can produce only produce good fruit. And a bad tree, bad fruit. So if you have a cell, we start at the cellular level. If you have a cell that's operating in the in its true nature, its true capacity, its true identity, it's 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 connected and reciprocal with everything around it all the time. And it, it's, it's an open living system. It's an open system. And it will do whatever it takes to contribute to the whole thing working, right? All of it. It never sees itself as a separate piece. It never sees itself as isolated. And its goal is never to move away and be by itself. This hmm. is why God said it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for people to be isolated. When that cell becomes, when its cell the identity of the cell becomes corrupted, it becomes cancer. The identity is now cancer. It's not cell, it's cancer. And what it does is it becomes a closed system and it begins to devour everything around it, right? And so when a human is operating in the truth of who they are, they're reciprocal. They, yes. they will only be other focused because they realize to live separate is to die. Right now, it, there's a parsing here. I don't know how to articulate this or ask it. Um, the fruit of the spirit is these things of love, joy, peace, patience, others focus. So help me understand how, how you're articulating the difference between true self, meaning righteous imparted with the Holy Spirit, because th there's dynamics here uh true face has majored on what i would say is shared identity you and i are we are saints who occasionally sin not sinners striving to be saints you and i are right. sons right. what your teaching has really stretched me and been a blessing for is on the specific identity it's not enough to know because he doesn't see jamie as son one and robbie as son two he says right. no like you are imparted with my righteousness you are saints you are part of the priesthood the holy spirit is in you and jamie is a left arm ligament as part of the body and i've made him as the specific identity and robbie is an activator who's this and that and uh you know we're specific do we know our specific identity so unpack i'm, I'm trying to our, understand like when we know our true identity we're speaking to we are christ in us and therefore the fruit of the spirit is others focused but there's a difference in that. Is it our specific identity that looks differently as part of the body of Christ? Yeah. So, right. So, for example, um, yeah, you're saying it like, so like when Paul gives the example of the body, right, there's these distinct parts, right? And so the one, so, you know, I'm a hand and you're a hand or whatever, or, or a leg or whatever. And so we want to operate. So the hand identity can be working in love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, and so can the leg. But unless they're working together, right, in their uniqueness, it's not a body, right? That's the key. And so, and, and I'm, 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 this is what's, I think, really hurting the church, hurt, you know, the church is, is we're not, it, in a, in, imagine in a city, so in our, our, in our particular church, so like our staff, if you went when when we have a new person come in or something and the, the pastor will say introduce yourself we don't we don't say our name we don't say like Jamie and I'm in charge of outreach we don't say that I, I, I will say my name my name is Jamie and in the kingdom of God I'm an untire of knots that's my identity in the kingdom I'm an untire of knots okay as an untire of knots I'm filled with love joy peace patience goodness kindness general self-control but what are you gonna do with the untire of knots identity Right. You're going to put them in your conflict areas in your city. That's what you're going to do with that beautiful identity. Right. And so the next person, um, uh, my name is whatever. And I'm a lover of the guilty. That's his identity. I'm a lover of the guilty. OK, so he's a son of God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with love, joy. But uniquely, he loves the guilty. Where do you 
it tells you where this person needs to be. Like, where would you put this lover of the guilty? With a bunch of, discipling a bunch of very biblical people? No. He would be super frustrated. All he would be doing is trying to get them interested in guilty people. Like, and it would produce, yes. it would cause trouble. So put that guy in the prison ministry. Unbelievable. He's unbelievable in there. So even if I went into a prison ministry and talked to a person and that loves it in there, I would guess that their identity has something to do with the lost or the, you know, do you see what I mean? And their identity will gravitate towards that. But boy, you should, when I watch people whose identity is not what they're doing, it's rough. It, it, it causes silos. It causes competition in teams. And it's everywhere in the church, but it's everywhere in everywhere. Everything is comparison. And so, um, so just to know my own identity is to know not just I'm a child of God and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but where uniquely, and it's not one spot, it's a range of places, but where does that thing come alive? And when we, yeah. when we do this with middle schoolers, it like you can almost pick their vocation once they understand this. Just by listening to them to start to talk, you're like, wow, I see where you're going. I see the direction you're going in. And then you can do everything to get behind helping that identity go in the way that it should go, disciple it forward, right? But it's not like discipleship for every human being in a formula that's for everyone because then it misses that beautiful uniqueness of each of us. So so let, what's the difference of what Jesus made possible in our identity for us versus a strength finder, everybody like what's your unique gifts, like strengths, like pick some words. What's the difference that he has made possible uh, for believers living into their identity? Because I'm a, unbelievers have unique design and specific right, design yeah. by God. Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny. So like a long time ago when, when uh, the CIA was, you know, doing all my psychological testing, they said to me, they said, uh, you're, you're a, a kind of a strange person because you hate conflict, but you gravitate towards it. So remember, my identity is untire of knots, militant peacemaker. I'm an untire of knots. So they're saying to me after all their testing, their profiling on me is, you're a person who hates conflict, but you gravitate towards it. Why? If you hate it, why do you gravitate towards it? The other weird thing about me is if, and I do hate conflict, but if I avoid conflict, I self-destruct. Hmm. You see that? It's so fascinating. So even though I can take a strength finders or any of those tests, Enneagram, all of them, it tells me something about myself in a way generally, but, but what happens when the false identity takes the test? <laughs> see, that's what happens. You get a skewed result. And we don't know because we don't know actually who the person is. It's like reading a resume. It's like, Wow, everything in this resume is self-protection and self-promotion. Everything I do in a test is self-protection and self-promotion, and I don't even know it because I, don't, I can't tell it in myself because I just live in the lie all the time. So I can. So the other day we were working with a bunch of youth, and um, one of the youth was absolutely unwilling to mix with the group. A new, a new youth into the community wouldn't wouldn't sit with the group wouldn't communicate with the group and we were gonna we got to spend one week with this group and so really you know like scary like wow is this person okay young young girl and so when i went to talk to her she was an expert in myers-briggs it was unbelievable she and the enneagram she could tell me things about myers-briggs testing and yet she herself was clearly wounded deeply wounded and so I would ask her, I was like, what is, how does the, tell me about your Myers-Briggs and why it's hard for you to be in a group. And she like, I don't know. I, I don't want to talk about that. So like an expert in Myers-Briggs and all, an Enneagram, what's your Enneagram number? But all those are, you, you know, those are telling you what, whoever took that test. <laughs> but I'm saying to you, the real you didn't take that test. The true you didn't take that test. So we spent three days with her, walking her into her true identity. And in, after three days, she would stand up in front of an entire group of people and, and share. 
and talk intimately about herself. The Myers-Briggs in them, they can't bring that kind of transformation. And even, even the, the way that they're painting a profile of a person can be skewed because the person is taking the test within a lie. Yeah. Yeah. And man, I just, I just wrote down, just as a good earthly father raises as the way they should go, knowing, seeing and knowing the hearts and the unique attributes of my six sons, how much more does our own father want that for us? And the beauty of us having a heavenly father is we have him to speak and direct and give clarity that our friends who might not know him don't have and that right. that richness. So part of this, I, I, I want to honor your time because um, and I'm going to take you up. I got it on the podcast that we're having we're hanging out with you and Donna. So we're going to road trip it. You tell me when and Emily and I'll road trip it. But it, it, another aspect that's been really freeing and I want to ask questions. Y'all, Jamie's stories the CIA, they were frequent enough, not an anomaly of, a, of hearing God once or twice. They were frequent enough that the CIA did, did an evaluation, and that led to some other stories that um, just paint point to a powerful, loving father. Uh, I love the one of, of the guy going, show me, the Jason Bourne friend of yours, and the, you know, who was like, show me, and yeah. this, and what that led to, and and your fears of seeing, uh, of going, God, I don't know. They, you know, I'm, I'm questioning your protection of my kids in Iraq and then what he showed you. So tell us about the confession, repentance, transformational language, because this is language that's been really freeing for Emily and I. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and this is what I, I love about the faith, you know, our faith, our, our Christian faith is these beautiful sacraments um, that we've lost track of. And so to me, confession is a sacrament. It's some confession um, is truth telling, right? If we confess our sin, if we tell the truth about our separateness from God, that's what that, when you say that verse, first John 1, like if, if, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. When you tell the truth about your separateness from God, what a powerful, that's a powerful statement then, if we confess our sins, which to me was always say you're sorry about your sin, which is, is meaningless. And there's nowhere in scripture where God is demanding an apology from people. Jesus never walks around going, I need you to say you're sorry for doing that. This is all us because saying you're sorry is an easy way not to deal with anything. Um, and so, but confession is deep. So my son um, is a special agent in the FBI. And so when he's working a case and he brings a person in and he says to him, I need you to write your confession. And they write down, I'm sorry on a piece of paper. Nothing is resolved. He's not, a confession isn't an apology. A confession is I need you to tell the truth. Just tell the truth. So a confession can be positive or negative. It's just, I'm a U.S. citizen, confession. Um, I struggle with fear, confession. Like, it's just truth-telling. And so truth-telling is the only thing that sets people free. Jesus said, knowing and experiencing the truth, knowing and experiencing the truth sets people free. And so the beginning of everything you're doing, especially in relation to God, is to tell the truth. God, I don't believe you're here. What a beautiful statement. I, God, I'm afraid that you don't love me as much as you love other people. Man, when you start by that, it's like the Holy Spirit moves like the wind in a room. This is my favorite thing to do with people who don't know Christ is to walk them into confession. It's before anything else, just to get them to understand how to truth tell, just it's like you open the window and like and the wind and the spirit just moves into the room because truth telling leads to repentance which is mind mind and life change if you're not going to tell the truth nothing's going to change and christians are famous at not telling the truth it's not that we're liars <clears throat> necessarily it's we actually don't know what the truth is we don't really know what we actually believe deep down in our heart because we're so used to just saying stuff like just you know I'll, you know 
be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication. Let your, like we know how to say all that stuff, but we ain't, we're not going to go anywhere where our lives in danger, right? Like because it's not down here. It's not part of our confessional life. And then in, in truth telling leads to mind change and form change. It doesn't guarantee it, but it opens the way for it. Truth tell leads to mind change and form change, which then mind that which then leads to transformation, which is actually changing the form of things. Um, mm. And so, <clears throat> the form of my life, the actions in my life, aren't going to change unless my mind and thinking <clears throat> is transformed. Romans Romans twelve. Submit yourselves to God, holy and living sacrifice. <clears throat> this is confession to me. And stop conforming to the patterns of the world, but be being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know the way in which to go, the perfect way in which to form yourself or your life patterns. And so it's true to a mind change, form change, and humans crave this process. All Muslims, Hindu, atheists, young, old, crave the freedom of confession. And because they want to know a different way, they just don't know a different way. So when I when I was teaching at this medical faculty university, um, it was a regional medical, so it was different universities all together. And I had been working with the dean of the university for a couple of years on identity. <clears throat> and so he wanted to bring us in because he said doctors have a high suicide rate. And as faculty doctors, they're, they don't know how to help students. And I said, well, it's because the doctors are getting their identity from being a doctor. And that's not an identity and all that. And so he, he, he called together this conference and he stood up at the beginning and he said, I'm going to start this conference with a confession. I've never seen a leader do this before. It was so great. And he said, I confess that the, that the, um, that the medical system in the United States is broken. The healthcare, whole healthcare mm -hmm. system is broken. I confess that. And he said, and I confess that what we're doing at this university is putting students into hundreds of thousands of dollars to, in debt and putting them in a system that we already know is broken. That's what, how he started it. And I said, it was so moving and the room was silent. All the doctors in the room and I, and so when I had a chance to talk, I asked, I said, I want to know, is what he said true? Is what he said true? Is, is, is he right? And all the doctors agreed he was in fact correct. And then, I, and so now we have a chance to change the way we think. We have a chance to repent. And so I asked them, can the system be changed? And they all said no. They all said no. And I said, why not? Because it's too big. Because if we try and change it, we're going to lose our jobs. Boom. There it was. There it is. Because if we try and change it, we'll lose our funding. There's where the enemy has them. There's the fear. There's the false identity. And the false identity is this. I don't believe that I'm worth protecting if we go to transform a system. That I'm just going to get run over by the system. It's going to put me into unemployment and no one's going to benefit anything from this. So let's just let it go and try and make as much money off this corrupt system as we can. Christians and non-Christians alike, we call it we call it being a chaplain for the empire. You're just a chaplain for the empire. You're not bringing transformation. So confession uh, of truth telling leads to repentance, which we turn to truth, and that's for unbelievers or believers. But the difference with believers is that when we confess truth tell to God. We have access to hear from him for that he gives us truth in turn. That changes our mind, our behaviors follow. That is transformation. Right. Now, confession for medical professionals, they still, that opens the door. But so I, I, I've processed the confession, repentance, transformation, but you're, I, that's a cool connection that transfer, that uh, confession, repentance is the, opens up and is connected to fear, which is is that the path for us to identify our fears which are connected to our lies absolutely when you when you're in confession what you're going to ultimately get to is your view of god <laughs> that's where you're going if you'll tell the truth and that's what god wants he he wants you to he wants to show you that you have a wrong view of him and your view of him is that he's either unable or unwilling to help 
And so that means, and the way we know that that's what a person believes is because then all of the weight of everything is now on you, right? Who's going to make me a good parent? Who's going to make me a good parent? I am. Like it's on me. Who's going to make me a good husband? I don't, I can read a thousand books, but ultimately I've got to just turn myself into this thing. And deep down, I know it's not, I can't do it. But, but then my question is, where is God in this? In what way is God involved in you being? And see, good husband's not an identity. That's not what God didn't say. I want you to go into the world and be the best husbands you can be. We did that. We create all this stuff. It just added burden. The true, you you take, when we work with couples, we, it's, we don't put them together and work with them. It's like two wounded people banging into each other's woundedness is never going to resolve anything. But two healed people can resolve anything. So we, we actually meet with them separately and just talk about their own woundedness. Like, mm. why does this freak you out so much? Why? And what it always comes down to in the individual is fear. They're afraid. Yeah. What are you afraid of? That I'm a failure. What are you afraid of? That I'm a terrible husband. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid. That, and, and it's just this fear and they're self-protecting and self-promoting to try and compensate for the fear. And a lot of that is by blaming other people, right? It's other people's fault. It's not my fault. It's other people's fault. And so, but what they're most afraid of is somehow that God is not with them. He's not yeah. with them. And that's where the Lord, it, it's interesting when you're reading through the scriptures and, and people are the, 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 you know, the eight or nine, what is seven or eight times God personally challenges an individual like Gideon or, and, and Moses, they give the same kinds of objections. I'm not capable. I can't, it's all about their perception of their own identity. Like, I can't do it. I'm slow. They're I am statements. That's what we make people say. Wait, make an I am statement about that. I am a failure. That's what you're saying. It's not like I feel like a failure. <laughs> it's I am. And God, when you make I am statements with God, he wants you to tell the truth about he didn't yeah. make a failure. That isn't what he, right? And so when they're saying that, they're admitting their fear of, of who they are. But then ultimate God's answer to him always is like, not like, I'll make you a powerful speaker. He doesn't say that to him. I'll make you wealthy. He says to him, I will be with you. I will be with you. I feel like that's not good enough of an answer for people. <laughs> like deep down yeah. to them, it's like, that's not good enough. I'm with you. Like I need income. I need like that's. But the best answer he could ever say to us is, look, I am, he, he says, am I not the one sending you? Like, do you don't get that? Do you think you're doing this by yourself? Because you talk mm -hmm. like you're doing it by yourself. And when you're doing it by yourself, you got to self-protect and self-promote. So I've been feeling that weight the past few days. It's just back from vacation. The waves have been hitting. I've been cracky at home, you know, not as present. I've been more about me, protection. Uh, Monday, yeah, em Emily had a hard day on Monday as well with eight little kids back from vacation. And she was talking about her day and I one upped her, which was like such a jerk idiot move of self protection. Exactly what you're talking about. But the, the, the processing, like I had the statements I've been feeling are like, I am disappointing, dropping the ball, like all these things in the busyness, the chaos, I'm uh, the, the, I am statements. So in, in your own process of this formation, uh, th this formation journey for you, um, what's your encouragement to me as I, continue to mature into these truths because I'm assuming you still have bad days and carry weight and especially in seasons like this for you is it how is it different now for you from when you were 40 and in, in that pattern yeah um yeah it's it's so it's like I go back to my wrestling coach this is like every day every day we practice every day we practice like that and and what happens is the day you stop practicing, the enemy is right there. The enemy is, mm. the enemy will outlast your zeal every time. <laughs> he doesn't care about enthusiasm. He doesn't care about up days. He'll outlast your zeal. But what he, what he can't outlast is your discipline, your discipleship, right? 
and this is what this is what real discipleship is. It's disciplining. It's like it's like so. Every here, here's my practice every morning. Back to being in wrestling practice is every morning I wake up and the number one thing I do is tell the truth about my fear every single morning. And I do it. I do it like I, I usually don't even have to do this because I already know what my fear is. I'm a disappointment. I already know it. The enemy's not creative. The enemy knows our weak place and just hammers it. Right. He knows he, he was there when I learned that I was a disappointment. He, he knew when I believed that lie about myself and that lie is deep. It's deep because it's a, it's attached to religion. It's a very deep that God is disappointed in you. Do you know how many times I heard that growing up? And so to believe God's never disappointed into me is, is very difficult to receive from God. Remember your measure of maturity in Christ is not what you can do for God. It's how much you can receive from God. That's the key, right? Is receiving from him. And so my discipline is I get up in the morning and <clears throat> I, I, I come into this particular room and I kneel down on the floor, put my head on the ground, on the floor. And the only reason I do that, I don't think that's any more special way to pray. But when I do that, the Lord just gave me this picture of all the weight that I'm carrying rolls off me. In that position, I can't hold the burden on my shoulders. It rolls off of me and it rolls right to his feet. And... And so, and then I let it roll off and I say what it is, God, in this day, in this one day, these are the things that you've invited me into. You've invited me into, and I am unable to do them. <laughs> like, I cannot do them. They're greater than me. They're more than my capacity. This is what I believe. And I'm giving these burdens and these lies to you that I'm a disappointment. And I visualize them rolling off my shoulder. He is kept in perfect peace whose mind and imagination is fixed on thee because he trusts in thee. I visualize them rolling off my shoulders to his feet. Cast all your cares on me because he cares for you. Uh, come unto me, all you who are heavy burdened. And I, I do what God invited me to do. Let, let him have it every day every day and i roll off and then always that's my confession god you know i've got to write so many chapters today i, I feel like my my creativity well is not deep enough i believe i'm a disappointment in this i believe i'm an empty all of that say them say them out loud let them search me and know me reveal to me any offensive way in me and lead me in the way. all of that and it doesn't take long and then once it's off take my yoke upon you Okay, God, what do you have for me today? I want to receive all that you have for me today. I'm giving you the lies, but I'm not leaving the house. It's swept clean, but I but it has to be filled with truth or I'll pick the lie right back up, right? So rolls off, Jesus, what do you want to give to me today? I want to receive all that you have for me in this day. Fill me up, right? And then I, I, I write down what he gives me. I make sure I, okay, this is what he says to me. And most of the time what he says to me is, I am with you all day long. I am with you. Don't forget that I am with you. So stay with me, abide with me. So during the day, I'll have a question and I'm right here. Ask me the question. I'm right. I feel like, I, I feel frustration right now towards this. Ask me a question about the frustration. Ask me a question. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of right now? Like that. I'm with you all day long. Stay with me. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Like that. Every day, that's my practice. And mm. and it, it, it gets me through one day, which is all God cares about. <laughs> right? Is the one day. Right? Yeah. He's, and so that's my practice. And I'm telling you, it's... Once you learn that discipline and you practice that discipline, you realize that in today, this is why I'm writing the book enough, today is enough, today is enough. Mm. And what you are able to walk through and accomplish with Christ in one day is enough. And, and mm. if someone tells you it's not enough, you're listening to the liar. Mm. That's the, the enough is God's word. I, I've spent a lot of my life, I, I'm a futurist, visionary, strategic guy. I've spent a lot of my life in the potential of tomorrow um, and struggled with contentment and present and, and anxiety and fear comes with thinking of tomorrow. And, you know, right. 
what that is, which is fear associated with disappointing not enough, those lies in the future. And that, yeah, the, the practice of enough and today, unpack for me what, what that does to fear. Yeah, so fear, so all fear is, is a directional signal. That's all it is. So nobody can make you afraid. No one has the power. Nothing has the power to make you afraid. We make, our, we, we make ourselves afraid. But the fear is not bad. The fear is good. What the fear is doing is telling you that something you do or believe or are thinking about doing is going to hurt you. And that's the value of the fear. But it's not a decision maker. It's just an indicator. It's a warning light, right? So like, and as soon as you address what the fear is pointing to, the fear is done and it goes away. You don't have to try and put the fear down. Just use it for what God gave us the ability to fear for and it, it goes away. So if I'm walking towards a cliff, the closer I get, the more this feeling inside of me stirs up like we're aiming for disaster. And if you get really close and look over the edge, unless you're a, a daredevil person, like you're, it's, the fear is blinding. But all you have to do is turn around and look the other way and take one step and the fear is gone. You don't have to run from the cliff. You just have to turn in a direction where the cliff isn't your future. <laughs> and the fear is done. It's gone like that. So hmm. when I have a fear, when fear pops up, the question immediately is, God, what am I afraid of? What is it? What am I afraid of here? The fear is telling me that something I believe about myself, God, or others is going, the, the, what I believe about them is going to hurt me. And so typically the fear is God's not going to be there for this. As soon as I start to believe that, my fear kicks in and goes, hey, do you know what you're thinking right now? Hey, do you know what you're thinking right now? You're thinking that God doesn't care about you. Flash, flash, like that's, and, we, and we're like, God, take away this fear. Don't, no, don't take it away. Use it and let it go, right? So my son, my oldest son, was in, in Afghanistan. He's been in all crazy places, and he, you know, he got sent to Afghanistan for a year. And for some reason, Afghanistan really it bothered me. And after my own life, and I would I would be talking to him, you know, the times I occasionally got to talk to him from Afghanistan, I would say, Hey, I'm just want you to know, I'm praying for you. I'm nervous for you. And he goes, Dad, why do you nervous? You raised us this like you raised us this way. Um, but what was I afraid of? So I was afraid he might get killed because he was in crazy situations. Um, yeah, but I know what happens if a person dies. They go to heaven. Like, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? That's what the Lord kept asking me. What are you really afraid of if, mm. if, if he dies? It means that God failed. That's what it means. Mm. It means that God didn't care enough about me to protect my kid. That's what it means. And that's what offends God. That thought. Mm. That, separ that thought separates me from God. Yeah. Because he because uh, it's not true. I I have a, a current processing and I'm assuming you've got that this way more. Emily and I both practically uh in, in going to God and trying to process our fears and then saying, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? Um, we're struggling to discern. It's like, man, I got to go. I'll hear the whisper to like, go do ministry to the local jail inmates. And we have eight kids and leading true face. And it, so it's a, the passions in this season are hard to discern what it is. And I, I'm, um, I think what you're sharing about the present enough is a missing component for us yeah. in that weight of trying the, the, the weight of processing and hearing from God. I don't know if we've added that today. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and this is, you know, again, this is the value of community because when, when you're in community, because I get, I, you know, get to do this with our folks every day. <laughs> I did it yesterday with a bunch of 20 year olds. It was so interesting. And, um, and just, and just saying, okay, when, cause I can, I, because I'm not them and I'm not in their fear. I, then I like, it's like, I can, you know, hold their hand and walk with them cause their fear doesn't affect me. And so I can keep asking questions. And, um, so like, I know that with you, I mean, I, it's like, I've done this so much over the years. I'm just never even questioned anymore. It's like, I, 
God is clear. He's clear in what, he, what, what he's inviting us into. He's clear. If he's not clear, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. Yeah. And he's clear. And so if we're muddled and confused and, and anxious, it's because, it's because of something that we believe that's not true. That's what's doing it. It's not God. It's not you. It's what you believe that's con- bringing the confusion. And so that's so all I do with people is ask them questions um, like they'll like one of these guys was talking to me about, like, should I go to this university or this university? And he's super stressed out about it. And I said, well, what's what's the benefit of the university? He already done all that there. You know, this one's good for this. This one's good. So like they're basically equal. Right. And he's like, yeah. And I said, so what do you believe about God that makes you so anxious about this? Like if they're both the same, pick one and go to it. Who cares? And he's and his belief is that I could go to the wrong one, right? And, yep. and there's nothing God can do if I go to the wrong one. Like, where did you get yep. that view of God? Like, where is that? Yeah. But I know where they get it. Oh, I know where they get it, right? So, so how do you? So in, in your season right now with ass podcast speaking, do this. Like, how do you discern as those come in? Like, what is your process for that? I know because I I can I can tell you exactly what God's invited me into this year. I know what he has. I'm very clear and it's only two things. And although I get all kinds of opportunity, if it's not one of those two, I just say no. Hmm. Like keep it's just keep it as simple. It's like God's like I'm going to throw 5,000 opportunities at you this year and you have to decide which one's my will. It's like he wouldn't do that. Like it's, will there be 5,000 opportunities? Listen, for a person walking in their true identity, there's a million opportunities all the time. That's the beauty of life. It's so beautiful. My wife calls the kingdom Costco. She said, it's like you get a Costco card. That's, and you, and you walk in the door and you're in Costco that, you know, you walk into the kingdom of God and you go into Costco and you go, Oh no, which mayonnaise should I buy? Which it's like, they've already been curated. There's three good ones. There they are. There's three of them. Pick one. They're all great. It's like that's the kingdom. When you step into that mm-hmm. kingdom with that relationship with the Lord, it's like going to Disney World and standing in the middle of Disney World crying because you don't know which ride God wants you to get on. <laughs> it's like get on the one you like the most. Where does your what ride makes your heart come alive? And trust me, we're all different. And and what's wild is because of identity, we've done this in in a room. Like we'll have 50 people in a room, we'll walk them through true identity, and then we'll say, okay, in our city, we have seven opportunities, in our city, seven opportunities. Fill out a card. Every time, the identity spread evenly across the opportunities. Do you know why? That's how God made us. And if we would just relax and say, tell me which one of these makes your heart go jump. And here's another one more prayer, important prayer. I pray with people. Let's spend some time asking God all the things we're doing for God that he never invited us into. That's a big prayer. Because the enemy's really smart about this stuff. And and when people, I mean, I had one of our folks yesterday tell me that she's lost her joy in what she's doing. And I said, move then, move, move, move. Get out, get out of it. Get, it because God has seasons. And he invites us things into seasons. And somehow we get in our mind that we're in this forever. Like he's the God that loves seasons. He loves, Mm. loves, loves seasons. Can't you tell by looking around? It's very unusual for God to make one thing stay that way forever. Very unusual. Mm. He loves Mm. change and development and movement. And so when you lose your joy, move season's over well done beautiful job great job god bless you and they were afraid to tell me about it like Mm. all these lies that are going to trap you in this serving mode that's embittering you yeah right jamie you have been so generous i i want to you are 40 minutes over what i asked you to commit and i thank you for that so i want to honor you and also let you leave us with any story or or insight that God puts on your heart, but just to encourage y'all out there, um, you know about the true face journey and nine month framework for group discipleship to process these truths of identity. And, uh, this book, there are true face journey groups right now using this book, 
uh, to help guide people. As you know, we talk about shared identity, that we are saints and we are sons and daughters of the king imparted with his righteousness. Do we know our specific identity, how he's made us to live into that? And these handles for me of confession, repentance, uh, check that out. Uh, jump into a True Face Journey group. Go to living. Uh, go to Identity Exchange. Buy Living Fearless, um, and I'll buy it for you if you don't have the money because this book is so powerful. Text me, uh, Jamie. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and if you want to leave us with anything, then it'd be an honor for me to pray for you on the way out. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, there's a thousand stories going through my mind. I'd love to tell, but um, yeah, I think, I think just to, just to remember that the ontology of God is love. The ontology of God is love and being informs doing. So if God's being is love, then what he does has to be consistent with his unconditional love. Um, even for even for his enemies, even when we were his enemies, Christ died for us. And so just hold on to that. And anytime you stop believing that God is love, you need to come back to the Lord and just tell the truth. Like, Lord, I don't understand the kind of love that would be with me, that would never be disappointed in me, that would always, always want to be with me and always want to encourage me. Just I would just keep coming back so easy to believe wrong things about God. Um, so yeah, blessings in that discipline of staying in the truth of God's love. Let it be so God. And I pray for this brother and the ministry he's doing and his wife and his kids that you will protect him as you have so faithfully. And, uh, thank you for his ministry. Um, expand it as, as his faithfulness leads to more, impact and reach uh, for your kingdom. Thank you for this, brother. We love you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie.